Okay. Let's bring this. Hopefully the music is working today. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. And today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my all-time very most favorite artists. We're going to be looking at an artist who couldn't be more different than the artist that we just spent the past week examining, Pablo Picasso. We are going to be looking at the art of Niki de saint Fal, And de saint Fal or saint Fal, uh, uh is, I, I think, one of the most... Uh, I think just on, on the on the surface anyway one of the the, the most exciting and in like playful fun artists that I can really think of uh, I, I would almost sort of go so far as to say like she reminds me a lot like her work of the same playful spirit that I see in the work of Henri Matisse uh, Matisse was Picasso's sort of, I guess, main rival, if you could think of. And, and Matisse spent a lot of time painting, you know, people dancing and having, uh, you know, he described his work as sort of being like a comfy chair for the viewer, which is a very, you know, people have written PhD theses about what exactly that means. So I'm not, uh, but I, th you know, I guess what I think Matisse meant is that, that art should be a place where a person can go and is sort of escape from other things in life, which is, you know, there's many people who not only, uh, well, who don't agree that that's what exactly what he meant there, but also who think that art should be something very different than that. On the surface, Niki uh, de saint Fal, her work is very fun and uh, very colorful, and again, carries that same, I think, tradition of Matisse on the surface. But below that, there's lots of other levels of meaning, some of which are, are really quite dark and intense. Um, and she uses her work to, to very obliquely uh, touch on some of these topics, which we'll get into in, in the, as we go here. So anyway, this is the painting that we're going to recreate. And I'll let you know that you can download a copy of uh, the template that I created for it. By clicking in the Dropbox, you're going to see a whole bunch of folders. All of these are paintings we've already made, right? There's tons of stuff in here. Uh, uh, pretty much every single style, genre, from most of the major countries on Earth. Um, and where are we? Here's where we are. Nikki de saint -Fal. You're going to see six files in here. You're going to see, of course, this image. And then you're going to see the outline which you can print off as I have done and then transfer it onto a canvas. I'll show you just how to do that in a moment. I'll also, just as a bonus, there. this is another painting of hers that I really liked. Or it's, um, I think this is actually done with pencils and pens and maybe gouache on paper. And then there's the outline, of course, as well. So if you're really interested and you want to do two paintings or you want to do this one instead, then you've been all the power to you. you got the tools there to do it. So maybe just right before we launch right into this, I'll just let you know that there's the uh, private Facebook group just for people like yourself. You can join the group, upload your version of today's painting to it, and you get some feedback from other people just like yourself, and work on artworks that, that we haven't done in class, but you've been inspired to do on your own. Uh, so here's a, this is really cool. I haven't looked, this is Eleanor's painting in memory of my sister. That is so cool. That is really neat. And so Eleanor joined us, you know, I was going to say relatively recently, but, you know, because I've been going and doing this for a, a year and a half um, and has really come along really, really quickly. And it's so exciting to see her making an image like this of something that's so powerful, meaningful to her and how beautiful it is. And if you're just joining us and you're starting off from ground zero, here's something you could be doing in matters of a month, right? Okay. Um... Let's take just a quick little look at who Niki de saint Fal was. Uh, she was born in uh, just outside of Paris, but grew up 
from about the age three in New York, in New York City and and uh, environs, I guess you could say, and eventually moved to San Diego, where she passed away at the age of 71. Now, uh, maybe just a little bit of a uh, trigger warning. We were maybe a, we, I don't want to dive too far into it, but she did have a very traumatic childhood. And that childhood involved some abuse, some sexual abuse by her father, uh, uh, beginning around age 11, and uh, you know, which is which is just horrible. And and but what I think is is very inspiring to me, and hopefully to anyone else who's had to go through uh, uh, you know difficulties like this, is that she managed to. Um, to sort of trans, she became a, a, a really powerful advocate for for childhood sexual trauma um, and and abuse, and used her art to to talk about some of these things and to and and also her personality. Is, she really, I think, was very. You know, she was a I guess a proto feminist. I don't know if she called herself a feminist, um, but she you know because. You know, I really f well. Uh, she, uh, I think she was really instrumental in in changing the 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 way that uh, the art world, and then I guess you could say beyond the art world, uh, looked at women as artists and the roles of women in society in general. Um, because she, for a long time, was one of the most prominent female artists in the world, especially in Europe. Even though she was living in the United States at the time. And uh, she, well, yeah. Let's 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 jump into some of these things here. She she never went to art school. She wasn't trained in in a uh, formal way. So there were many people who who labeled her an outsider artist, which is one way that the uh, that the people in the inner circle of the art world used to exclude anybody who didn't have. The, the, the requisite credentials from the right places to play the game, right? Um, and yet, she didn't care. She just kept on going, what, doing what she did. And her sort of just boldness in, in pursuing her, her dream and her career, despite all of the, 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 the walls and barriers that were put up in front of her, is, a, is super inspiring. And also attracted the attention of a lot of other very important people in the art world, people who were men at, at um, uh, originally at, at that at this point in her early part of her career, and she ended up collaborating with with really the most important artists of the '60s and '70s uh, on her rise into uh, art world uh, fame, I guess you could say. So. You know, here's some of the, the you may have, we did a Jasper Johns painting for American Independence Day, July 4th, the white flag, if you recall that. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg is a great artist. We haven't done a Robert Rauschenberg uh, piece, but I have a connection to Robert Rauschenberg. I, I was awarded the Power of Art Award for teaching by Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, I don't know how long, 20, 15 years ago, um, and uh, from the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, and right before he died, so, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, she later married the artist Jean Tinglet, who is, uh, you know, uh, he's sort of royalty in France for his kinetic moving art. Um, what do I want to say here? Um... You know, I, 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 she she got married at age 18, and her husband was not a particularly great fellow either, right? So she's she had a number of of, of uh, very negative relationships with men throughout her life, especially the earlier ass parts of her life, and, and her husband was a serial um, cheater and. Uh, when she confronted her husband about cheating on him, uh, she had a he basically turned her into an asylum where she had electroshock therapy. Uh, I mean, it, you I mean you can just like yeah we electroshock therapy and she uh, 
almost died from you know sleeping pills that she was taking to try to get over this whole trauma trauma that she was being sort of re-traumatized by her own husband um and you know despite all of this continued to pursue her goals of and her interest in art one of the let's see the the first major pieces so as a young woman I, you know she, she she got married she had two children and raised children and you know that was in like the 19 i think 1951 so she's only like she, yeah she's 18 years old like 20 when she has kids and then when she separates kind of by the time she's 30 uh she's now i think has a lot more confidence um and she starts making these sculptures that are made of uh found materials in this case like doll parts right and uh you know this kind of reminds me, uh, kurt cobain from nirvana uh the band nirvana was uh did kind of similar artwork not really near as accomplished as she did but was also really interested in using doll parts as part of uh, artwork that he did during his short life but where she really comes into her own is where she starts uh embedding paint balls of b balloons of paint into her artwork and let's see if there's um her shooting paintings here so she would embed these blobs uh, and b and balloons of paint into her artwork and then you see her she would do these stage these events where she would shoot at them and of course causing the paint to explode and splatter all over the place and you know i think partly in response to to the the abstract expressionists who you know the, these big male guys jackson pollock and willem de kooning you know just dripping in testosterone and splattering paint all over the ground i mean i love their work but it, but it was all a lot about this hyper masculine energy. And so, how does a woman, you know, when that's the dominant art form at the time, how does a woman make sense or or, or get a foot into the door? And this was her way of doing it, which I thought is 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 genius. I think it was really is brilliant. Um, these works. The, the, I've seen these in person, and they're they're beautiful works. And until you realize, like, oh wow, that's crazy that you're shooting at them. And some of them are more elaborate than others. Obviously, some are you know have just a little bit of paint oozing out of them, and then some of them are like super gooey and gross, right? So that's kind of how she becomes internationally well known very quickly for that. And then afterwards, let's see if we just kind of go back a bit. Uh, she starts making these giant sculptures, which she calls Nana, and Nana is also the title of today's artwork, and or Nana Power, and Nana, um, you know, roughly translated, is sort of like you know a, a, a like a cat call, like uh, like you know somebody saying hey look at that chick or something or even w younger kids saying like na 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 and you know like ha 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 or boo hoo like it's sort of it's, so it's like this it, it's there's nothing really positive about that term but she and i know i'm sure this is a term that was thrown at her when she was younger per perhaps even by her own father to keep her quiet in some of the awful things that he was doing to her tra to traumatize her and she's taking back that word and transforming it into something like this kind of a superhero and i just i i just have so much admiration for for the way that she was able to take these negative experiences and and tr and use them as fuel for her art and transform herself into an internationally well-known artist um, so how about let's get right into the paintings. We'll talk about more about her biography as we go through. So how are we going to make this? Well, let's, I'm going to show you how we can take the outline and transfer it onto the canvas. So I'm just going to play this video and talk over top of it as it happens here. So you can see here's a, a 
uh, I've printed it out onto just my inkjet printer at home onto paper and it's I'm gonna tape it down here onto a 9 by 12 sized canvas you can use a bigger one or smaller one depending on on how you're able to print it out and you can just see I was just taking my fingers and checking on either side to, to make sure that it was relatively centered and now I'm gonna use some carbon paper that I'm gonna put underneath and you could see that carbon paper has been used at least 20 times so just because you use it once doesn't mean it's garbage you can keep on going around and around and around on it basically until it doesn't leave any kind of a mark right and I'm not gonna share the entire tracing process because it's pretty straightforward here Right. and I break a few pencils <laughs> along the way and there we go right so it's, there's a few places where uh, it doesn't transfer like up here and you can see I just take a pencil and finish that off okay and then we're left with our this and you've got you know another one on the back side should you choose to use it for any particular purpose I give these to our daughter and she colors on them or and chews on them <laughs> so uh, let's begin now I'm gonna start this painting as I as I start virtually every painting and I'm gonna use some warm yellow that I'm gonna put on this canvas now this is an old tube of paint that I have had for a while I don't know if there's any I think it, it still looks like it's I can get some paint out of it so I was going through a bunch of my older paints from when I was teaching these classes in person oh, got a little bit in here okay so let's grab a big brush and some water this is the only time I'm gonna use water to make today's to make any painting really yeah let's just stir it up This paint has, seems a little bit watery to me, so I wonder if that's... If I, I might have put water in there at some point years ago, I'm not sure. Who knows what I was thinking? I don't even know what I'm thinking right now. Yeah, that's very watery. I, I bet you there's... I, I might have used this for this exact purpose to teach people how to do this when I was teaching in class. And that's why it's still a little bit watery in there. So that's why I'm just adding more to it. Yeah, that's definitely, or that was definitely a diluted tube. So anyway, I'm going to take this yellow paint and applying it all over the surface of this canvas. This is sort of my own little trademark um, process here typically artists will use a, a warm rusty brown color as a foundational color which artists have been doing particularly the Italian artists because they were really the first ones to do it and the name imprematura the first layer of paint is where this process comes from really the most probably the most famous group of artists that did not do this or at least some of them didn't would be the impressionists because they wanted maybe a little bit more luminous um, kind of effect with their color and whereas I, I'm trying to teach like an intro class and sort of I'm trying to show people kind of how the majority of, of artists over time have have made art would do a foundational layer like this. And I also really like the effect it gets because we're gonna get just the slightest little bit of uh, a warm Kodachrome kind of quality. Like a, if you know anything about photography, it's sort of like the golden hour look of, you know, where everything just kind of got that sparkly yellow, warm yellow glow. Um, okay, so, well, I'm going to put this aside for a moment and let it dry and then squeeze some paint out onto my palette 
And I've got all, again, some more of these paints that I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going through all these. Let's see if I can get anything out of these old tubes. And I see a lot of the chat um, is about Donna, who uh, had a bad accident the other day and is in hospital and or was in hospital. I hope you're out of the hospital already, Donna. That looked like a pretty nasty situation. So we all hope you're getting better soon and you'll be able to join us and paint along. So I'm putting down this, this is a cool yellow and, and I'm gonna use this cool yellow to do the, the the, the bright green in the background here. All right, so that's good. I ended up using some paint, which was just sitting in a box that I didn't even know until this morning. So that's my yellow. I do have other, I have a whole bunch of other tubes that are kind of slightly half, almost empty, but rather than just me sitting here squeezing paint out of tubes, the next little bit. Let's uh, let's see if I can actually can get something. I just said I wasn't going to do this, and here I am doing it. Uh, I don't know what... Uh, it's like the, one half of my body doesn't know what the other half is up to, so... <laughs> uh, let's just get out the rest here before I put everyone to a sleep like. I clean up my studio. So here's some actual paint. All the paint that I'm using, I'm using six different colors. And these six different colors form what is called a split complementary palette, or split primary palette, my apologies. Split complementary is totally different um, and if you're wanting to buy the exact paints that I use I would buy the exact paints I use if you weren't trying if you're trying to replicate what I'm doing it's very helpful to do that otherwise you're gonna get different results which again sounds maybe obvious to some but um, if you're new to painting it might not be quite so obvious. Okay, got a nice, uh, nice palette set up. So, I'm gonna blow dry this, and then, oh, so I'm gonna mute the microphone for a moment, and then we'll start painting on it. Okay, so let's take a quick sip of tea here and look at the image and just think about how we're going to do this. Hmm. Uh, 
Okay, so the way that I want to approach this is probably starting with some details in the center uh, and then working my way out and then probably finishing with the red. Well, you know, generally the way that I, I always work is I work from the background to the foreground and then background and then finish on the foreground. Now, with this one, you know, there every color is more like puzzle pieces. So there's not really layering of paint happening so much here. Uh, but I th I'm just thinking I, I am compelled to want to put some white on here right away. So I think I'm going to do that. Um, actually, just go right into the white. And so the question would immediately ask, like, why Why are you even bothering? If you're going to start painting white on things, do, would you even bother putting the yellow here? And that's because we are going to paint red on here. And, um, and there's going to be some yellow coming through in little... If we miss little bits, if we don't get the the paint to match up with in, in these little puzzle pieces, I don't want to have just white coming through. White is such a boring kind of color, right? It just makes things look unfinished and sloppy. And this yellow, if it pops through in these little spaces between colors... It's going to make it look more complex, more professional, beyond also giving it this nice warm glow. So I'm going to put this white down uh, all over where, and I'm going to paint, just sort of eyeball a lot of the, the lines. Now some of these lines are going to come through the white. And some of them won't, but... So if you're really, really worried about losing some of these details, then you may want to think about uh, doing some of the outlining first and then coming back over top of it with the white as I'm, uh, I'm doing here. But I think this is going to work out just fine. You know, one thing I do, you know, looking, thinking about the Picasso series that we just finished, I think one thing that I want to do maybe a little bit more than, than I have recently is just really take some inspiration from the looseness of his paintings and uh, maybe kind of going forward trying to just be a little bit more accepting of, of some of the like have a little bit more of an unfinished look in some of the paintings that I do in terms of these classes so that I'm not so obsessed with spending eight hours working on one of these paintings which I have done once <laughs> um, in fact as I do this I can still see my lines underneath so I'm just going to go right over top of everything here <laughs> you know, like, I started doing this, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? Let's just, speaking of being loose. And this is just white right out of the tube. So I can also, you know, as it's sort of drying, I kind of just go over top and just sort of brush the paint around so that it kind of makes it just a little bit more transparent. 
Now we're gonna put some really dark colors in these, the limbs, so I'm not worried about paint. I'm just gonna paint right over those. That'll be pretty easy to hide. And then maybe, you know what? Let's just take this and I'm gonna go The more paint, layers of paint that I use here is just going to make all painting easier. Um, I find like if my paint is really, uh, if, if, if I'm painting on a canvas that's really rough and has a lot of texture, it drives me absolutely nuts. That's why I always gesso the canvas and then uh, sand it down before I even begin painting to get the smoothest surface possible. Okay, so maybe while I'm right here, I got a little bit of white on my brush. I'm going to take a bit, I'm, I'm going to paint mostly red in here. I'm just going to take a bit of white as well. And I'm going to use a bigger brush as well. Let's go almost the same size that we used to start this painting. So I'm going to paint this a, a, a much deeper red afterwards, but a little bit of white is going to really help make that deep red pop really nicely. The other thing too is I want a really nice solid red. If I just painted that red directly on the this yellow surface without any uh, white in there, my fear would be that it would go a little bit dark, and then I, I could end up spending maybe two, three extra layers on top of what I'm about to do, just trying to get an even surface that doesn't have any streaks in it. So even though this is pink and I want to go to this nice warm red, by the end, I'm adding this extra little layer of, of uh, paint as a, it's kind of another foundational layer. And this, the yellow that's here isn't being obliterated, it's not disappearing, it's still in here, mixing very subtly into the pink that we see, giving it not just a like a bright pink, but a tiny little bit of a of a um, peachy quality. Okay, so really here when I'm going over top of it, it's not to, I'm not really concerned about streaks, I just want to make sure I don't have any big clumps of paint, 
because that will also kind of frustrate the even flat surface here. So, it's going to clean this brush off. Uh, Lolly says, Michael, speaking of being loose when painting, do you think your style has changed since doing these lessons? Do you think your art has changed over the years? Uh, have you always had such a carefree attitude towards your art, or did you become more relaxed about it over time? Wow, lots of great questions there. Lots of great big questions. Has my style changed? I don't know. Um, what it has done is opened up my mind for potential different things that I can do that I might not have thought were even within the range of possibilities in the past, right? So um, you can my website is down below. You can see my website and you can see the different paintings I've done. And I've done paintings that range from basically fully abstract artwork to much more realistic artwork, I guess you could say. And um, doing this series where I'm painting the art of especially some of the more classical painters like Leonardo da Vinci, um, Titian, Goya. Uh, I never really thought about how to uh, like about me using those techniques in my art until I started teaching these classes and then it was like huh actually maybe maybe I because, you know, these are things I learned in school, but then sort of, you know, you, you that's that's been a while, <laughs> 20 years since I've been in school. So as time passes, you sort of get into a routine and you're, you start doing things a certain kind of way. So these classes have sort of opened my eyes back again to the possibility of you reincorporating some of those techniques, which I'm doing in the book. I'm doing a graphic novel. I'm illustrating a, a, a comic book biography about... A very famous Canadian artist named Tom Thompson. We did a whole week on Tom Thompson's artwork back in July on the anniversary of his death. And so I've been kind of using some of those techniques in that book that I'm working because I'm basically hand painting the entire 180 pages, which is crazy. I don't know why I decided to do that, but it's going to look awesome when it's done, which is... Uh, <laughs> my publisher and editor are, are quite stressed out over when it will actually be done. Um, but it will get done, and it, I think it's going to look really cool. Anyway, uh, so let's... Uh, what should I do next? I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to blow dry this and paint... Or, you know, maybe let's go back into the middle here. Instead of me finishing the background, because maybe I'll drip some paint and make a mistake. So it is kind of satisfying to get the center and then work my way out. So I'm not like that. the Picasso painting I did yesterday where I did all this painting around the edges and then had to kind of awkwardly reach into the center to finish it. So let's, let's uh, Michael, learn, try to learn something. Um, so let's see. How do I want to do this? Even though this white here is a little bit transparent and I see some of the yellow coming through, again, I don't mind that. I'm gonna leave it. Um, I like that look of, of the little bit of a, it, 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 to me, it is the trademark of a painting is, is the little bit of subtlety of colors that have been overlapped. So I like that a lot. So I'm going to leave that. And what should we do first here? Uh, 
Let's do the green, because we've got a bunch of green, and, we, and I think that would feel satisfying to see some of that coming uh, to fruition on the canvas here. So let's take some cool yellow. Let's take a, a bunch of it. There's a lot that we're going to be painting. And let's take some cool blue. We mix these together, and we get this really nice, super saturated green. I do think her green is a little bit, it's a little, uh, slightly more grassy quality, which tells me that there might be a little bit of red in there. So this is, this is a, as saturated of a green, of a lime green as you can get, because we're using two colors that are side by side on their color wheel. So we can't get a more intense green than this. And really, you probably don't want to unless you're trying to actually paint a fluorescent green, um, which is such an unnatural color. So in my mind, I'm just debating, do I want to add... Like, let's just see. If we took a bit of the warm green, warm... Uh, this is more like the color we're gonna get. It's it's a slightly different, slightly more grassy quality. I don't know if you can even see the difference on camera there. It is so subtle. And I, I'm just compelled to, I like this color. So part of me is really compelled to wanna use it. So do I wanna change things? Let's go, let's, let, it is a master study. So let's study from the master. Um, you know, so let's take some of this warm yellow and mix it into our super saturated green and just altering this green just a little bit. If you want to stay with a little bit more of a saturated lime green, by all means, you can use that mixture. I'm just going to show you how I get a little bit closer to the color she's using. All right, okay. So now let's uh, take this color. I might have to go around twice just to get a nice even distribution. It, assuming that's what you want, but you don't, and you don't have to do that. You know, if I had, if I didn't paint this white underneath, I probably could have just painted that lime green, cold green right over top of this warm yellow and let those colors mix optically. So maybe I, I, I would have been pretty smart of me to do if I had been thinking about it because it would be nice for people to see how that works, but. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, right? Okay, I'm just gonna paint that like that. 
And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll define that later on, but that's okay, just like that. Uh, I think I might just blow dry this and I might paint this green a second time before I just move on and then or maybe maybe I should just paint some red and then we'll let yeah we'll let this kind of slowly dry so I'm gonna paint a little bit of red let's start zooming in here so I'm just gonna take the warm red right out of the tube without any white because we've got white down here now already so I'm gonna go in and paint these little heart shapes So some of these are, are pretty small details. You could use an acrylic pen to do this type of stuff. The Posca markers, which I, I have used many times and is part of these classes. Um, so I'll, uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna use them today or not. doing outlines. They certainly are very helpful, like to really clean up uh, your lines. Like I can be pretty messy just like with these little triangular shapes here and then when I do my outlines later you know, maybe I'll use Posca pen here. I'll, I'll describe what those are when we get a little closer to it They look a lot like Sharpies, um, but they're much, much, I, I can't recommend them more, more strongly than actually using Sharpies, because Sharpies would be a, a, probably a bad idea to use on your canvas, just because they're just, their painting's going to look great for about a week, and then it's, it's going to start to go purple as that Sharpie starts to fade right sharpies aren't intended to be used for art they're intended to for lots of every other pretty much every other purpose on earth but not really for making art at least not art that's intended to last oops Okay. 
So I, I think this image, you know, I have it on the screen there as no date because I couldn't find exactly when it was made. My guess is that it's somewhere in the 1970s that she did this. Because what what happens is that she's she her basically most of her of her early art is sculpture based. Um and her early sculptures she's using a lot of very toxic materials um, a lot of like fiberglass and fiberglass is you know you can do great things with fiber i used to own my own company in los angeles and we did fiberglass casting for for our for myself and my friend that started the business with me we we did our own fiberglass casting for our own artwork but we you know would do that also for other artists and it is nasty stuff like at the end of the day you know you'd you'd we would we're, we were wearing respirators and all that kind of stuff and you know taking our clothes and you know changing right there in the studio and then immediately going and showering and yet all night long you'd be just itching because it's these t like you know if you ever you know when you get your hair cut and then afterwards i don't know about you but i'm i just i need to go home and shower immediately um but uh it's just so it feels like those little tiny itchy hairs and it and that stuff it's it's not it's much worse than than little hairs on your neck it's like stuff that when it gets into your lungs just tears up your lungs and that's what happened to nikki de saint Fal. She started having breathing, she started making these sculpture works in the early 1960s. By 1968, she was having severe respiratory problems. She basically had to retire from making these sculptures herself. She did hire people who were doing a lot of that work for her, but you can imagine how frustrating that would be if you're, if you basically can't use the material you've been using for almost a decade and you've got to switch to doing something else. So she starts collaborating with uh, a manufacturer that manuf she would make like little small models out of clay and then turn them over to someone else who would who, who could build them for her, uh, which can be expensive, but it also allowed her to make much larger pieces and then to start making public artwork. So not just small sculptures made of chicken wire and plaster and fiberglass in her studio but monumental giant sculptures that are now in plazas and public parks major museums around the world so as as you know I, it, the silver lining is that it it basically that those health problems and she lived for another like 20 30 years after this right so the silver lining is that Yes, she couldn't make those sculptures on her own anymore, but it forced her to access some, you know, more, some outside help that then allowed her to, to compete for these, you know, large commissions. Uh, okay. So maybe maybe now I'm gonna since I got this green brush and I was about to clean it, let's just take another pass on the artwork here with this green. Come on. What's going on here? There we are. <laughs> so Should have blow dried some of this, but I'm probably going to go over. 
after I even get the red in the background, I think I'm gonna I go over top of it with. Okay, I'm gonna redo this outline with white, which I think is gonna make a nice little sharp outline. And I'm also, again, trying my best to try to avoid any high textured areas so that, because that's always a bit of a problem. If you're trying to get a really nice, even layer of paint, texture can be a bit of a pain. I don't not, I have nothing against texture, but if there's little mountains and peaks and valleys there, it just makes it a little bit tricky. Because now you gotta kinda go up and down So you can see the color is getting darker as I do a subsequent layer over there. I probably could have put a little bit of white in there, uh, which I did not do. So because probably that that warm yellow I put in has has also darkened the color a little bit. But you decide how important it is for your artwork. Like, I mean, I mean, I could do that right now. I could just add a little bit of white and do a third layer over top of things. I don't know. I think I like this, though. And I, I don't even really know yet, because there's still so much of the painting that's yet to be done. Like, that, this red color I'm about to put in there, that's going to transform the whole painting quite radically. Lolly says, have you always had such a carefree attitude towards your art? Uh, I don't think so, no. I used to be pretty obsessed with perfection. And uh, I've talked about this book before, and I talk about it with my students in class. So I'm just going to bring it back up again. Um... This book, it's called Art and Fear, Observations on, and, uh, on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making. Great book. I make all my students at, oop, at university read this book by Bales and Orland, David Bales and Ted Orland. I think this book came out, when did it, is there, let's see if we scroll down here. First, 2001, I, I had this feeling it was written in like the 70s or 80s. That's really interesting. Oh, you know what, I have a... <laughs> I just remembered I actually have a copy of the book right here. So you can see I've, here's all my notes in there. Um, and then here's another, here's sort of like the part two of this book, which the librarians at Emily Carr, the university I teach at, let me know because um, all my students are always coming in. Instead of buying the book, they want to read the, uh, the library's copy. So, um, but anyway, the reason why I mention art and fear is that one of the things they talk about in that book all the time is the importance of just making a lot of artwork that you do not really improve at all. If you obsess on making one perfect artwork, good luck. You'll never get there. It will just literally never happen. The only way to get better is by doing 
it over and over and over and and letting go of your need for everything to be perfect and the and the more you do the more you just sort of like eh, whatever oh i i forgot i even made that i Oh, looks good. Or I don't. I, doesn't look good, but who cares? I'm just gonna make another one. And you start just when you let go. It's like just the. It's like a weight lifts off your shoulders. Yes, I do have two cups of tea here. I'm a, I love my tea. <laughs> okay. So let's put some yellow in here this is it is a warmer yellow but I think I'm gonna go for a cooler yellow let's see let's see how how this oops um, this yellow here is definitely a much warmer yellow but I'm gonna just try putting in the cooler yellow to start I can always modify it later. really just using this cool yellow because I've got a lot of it on my palette and I don't think I can fit it back I think my well my I can't get it back into the tube certainly but I also my extra little jar that I put my extra stuff in is full so I'm like well unless I plan on making a second painting today and all that's gonna go down the tube so or down the drain so <laughs> it's just me trying to being a little bit cheap and and also it's again like I say every time I, I see paint going down the drain and or into the garbage it just drives me I just feel so terrible uh, what I'm gonna do this looks like a little strap on this dress like the shoulder strap here that I kind of covered up so I'm just put, painting that a little bit back and then when I paint this a dark dark color later we'll capture that uh, okay so now this uh, dark blue so that dark blue looks to me kind of like almost like the a midway like a cobalt blue so I'm gonna take some warm blue I'm gonna take a good heap of cool blue and a bit of warm red and mix this together and so what I end up getting is is almost a it looks cobalt blue if I put a bit actually that's not bad right like that that might be good enough, but I'm just going to put a bit more warm red in there. And now we get a little bit more of what is more closely, looks to me more like a Prussian blue, as it's called. That's a great color. That's cool. And so again, it's just using other colors. If the color is too intense, using a color on the other side of the color wheel to help pull that color away from the outside edge towards the middle and desaturate it a little bit. Okay. 
So let's take this dark blue. And then maybe even let's zoom in even closer. And we'll start kind of doing some of these patterns that are up here. almost compelled to do the outline here first My, this the way that I do it I'm probably gonna you know not get quite exactly what she had here so just be brace yourself I just real I don't know if you could hear I just realized our baby monitor was on in the background. My wife is just getting our daughter up from her nap. That's one of the reasons that's that's the reason I was a little f 5 minutes late for today's episode is our daughter did not want to go down for her nap. She was having a great day. <laughs> and full of energy so one of the things you may notice here is this paint is a little bit streaky and I haven't done anything I haven't added white or water to it or which would make it even more streaky than it already is. I don't mind the streakiness as I said this is I'm not surprised by by this I, I find blue of, of of all the colors tends to just get streaky quite often it just tends to be a little bit more of a transparent color and we are using fairly inexpensive of paints and that is often a feature of less expensive paints is that they can sometimes be a little bit more transparent, right? Because you've got a lot of filler in here and less pigment, right? When you're buying really expensive paints, part of what you're buying is a higher pigment ratio in there. And the more pigment you have, the more expensive it is, right? It's just like the difference between a McDonald's hamburger and a one at a really nice restaurant ostensibly it's because McDonald's one has more fillers of some kind and less lower quality beef but maybe not who knows I mean maybe it's just all perception right I don't know I'm a vegetarian anyway so 
I haven't eaten McDonald's in a long time. Especially since they took their veggie burger off the menu, there was basically no reason for me to go there anymore. How on earth did I skip? I don't know if how that, that's happened, but it's okay. There's all of these extra shapes were supposed to fit in here, and I don't know. Okay. So I do my best, right? I kind of that kind of thing I actually enjoy because it's like, ah, okay, well, I guess that means I can do whatever I want here. Maybe I'll just start doing a little bit more of that over the rest of this painting. Rather than obsessing about making it exactly the same. So I think I might just be inspired by her work rather than try to copy her work, right? So this might be some of the slowest part of making today's painting. Depending on how you're making it. If you've ever been to Paris and been to the Pompidou Center, which is the main art museum, or modern art museum in Paris, it's the building that looks like an um, inside-out building, you have probably seen this sculpture that is loud and it, there's all sorts of banging noises and sounds out front right in the main plaza where there, you'll often see people sitting and having lunch and drinking wine and there's lots of cafes and stuff around. That sculpture that sits right out in front of the Pompidou Center is by uh, Niki de saint Fal's second husband, Jean Tinglet. And uh, I, 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 I love his work as well. His work is, you know, uh, Alexander Calder is credited as being the, the inventor of the mobile, right? Alexander Calder made these great big sculptures that hang from the ceiling and they move. Some of them are, are, are on the ground and they're often, you know, um, activated by the wind or people pushing them. Um, Tinglei... He his work is also sometimes uh, activated by the wind, or I think often also by electricity and motors. But is is much like maybe less pretty. It's more kind of rough and like how would you describe it? Sort of. Uh, kind of a little bit like Niki de saint Fal, like it has a bit of like an outsider art quality that it's it's it has this rough 
like um, yeah, it's just it's, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, it. A lot of things are made out of recycled materials, and so unlike Alexander Calder. It's, they're just like loud and kind of obnoxious and uh, some people really d don't like his art at all and some people love it pre precisely because it sort of seems kind of rebellious that it does all these things that maybe it's not supposed to do that it's you know loud and um, and rough and annoying to people. So it's funny that the two of these people kind of get together. Uh, they're both sort of making art that has all of the the trappings of, you know, an outsider artist, which is, again, a term that is often used to belittle artists because they're not part of the academy. And... Although I, I'm pretty sure he went to art school. Okay, so what we'll do after I get... Oops. I'm going to be fixing a few things here with white anyway. So I just want a little bit more white around that space, but that's pretty good for right now, I think. Oh, I see some purple. So how about get some purple? So I'm going to take some cool red, which I haven't used yet, and let's take some warm blue and mix those together. It's a pretty dark purple. So it's going to take a bit of white. I'm excited to see so many people watching today's episode. You know, I thought maybe after the Picasso series, a lot of people would just disappear because, you know, Picasso is obviously very well known, and there's a big exhibition of his that just opened in Toronto at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the AGO. So it makes me really excited that people are tuning in to, to look at Nikki de saint Fal's work because I think she's just as important as Picasso is. Right? Picasso chews up all of the air in the room. So I'm glad to see that, that there's still a little bit of room oxygen left in the room. Um were Nikki de saint Fal. Okay. So, what should now that I'm, I've got a lot of the main details in place? Actually, let's just zoom back out. Okay, so really, we're, I mean, 
ideally what I could do now is I could just start painting the black in here and I think I will use black today or well do I want to use black today or make a dark color I might make a dark color and st still yeah let's do a dark color and then we'll, yeah we'll still outline with some black so we'll have a little bit of two different um, uh, darker colors here so I need some more warm red where did I put my did I put my tube of paints back away oops sorry blink Okay, so I'm going to take warm red and I'm going to add some cool blue to this color here to get my darkest color possible with this current palette. I'm just going to use all that red and then I'm going to get some more warm blue onto the palette or sorry this is cool blue my apologies let's see if that's enough Okay, that looks pretty good. So right now it has a bit of a purple quality, which is to be expected. Red and blue, even though they're across the color wheel from one another, we mix them together, we're gonna get a purple quality. So to kind of reduce, get rid of that, I'm adding some cool yellow to it. And that cool yellow just completely deadens the, the purpleness and pulls that color towards the center of the color wheel. And right there now we've got basically a very, very, very dark gray. There's basically no color in it. It's just not pitch, pitch black, but it's it's about it's pretty darn close. So I'm just gonna quickly paint this in with a bigger brush. I'll probably have to do another quick coat here. Which is why I made that big batch of my of that dark color just now. Knowing that okay, I'm gonna have to probably make a little bit of this. Make a little extra of it, so. Okay, I don't know how closely I'll go around to do all of this detailing because I'm going to use a Posca pen to, with, that's a black Posca pen to kind of get into the 
to the outlines. So knowing that, I can leave this pretty rough. And I'm just gonna actually. Well, you know, the one thing about rotating it is. Uh, Rotated, I like. It's hard to kind of actually see what I'm supposed to be painting. So there's still a little bit of of transparency here. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, so I think you know this area right there is just, is a little thin here. So I think before I just do anything else, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a bit of white. I know she didn't do this, but some green there as well. I'm also just going to do that here.
So I'll just show you, look, if we zoom back out. I've made this white outline a little bit more even, at least for right now. And I think I'm going to go a little bit wider with some of the green. It's just the way that, uh, as I was painting it, it felt like a little, it was getting a little bit crowded. So I needed to expand that. Paulus says, my video is off. Um, I don't know if anyone else can confirm that, but I seem to be okay. <laughs> I'm still here. Uh, I noticed my audio, everything seems to be going okay. Is anybody else uh, experiencing the same problem as Paula? Please let me know if, if, if the video is stopped for some reason. Oh, Paula says okay now, okay. That's good to know. Well, weird things happen, right? Let's, uh, I'm gonna take my black. Or my really dark color, anyway. And I'm just gonna go back. Over some of, the, of where I just finished painting and just darken that. Just to even it out and get rid of the streaky quality. Not that, again, the streakiness is not an inherently bad thing. It's just that for this particular painting, I think a little bit more of an even quality is desired. So. He says the video is fine, so maybe it was just your internet connection or something there, Paula, that stuttered or stopped for a moment. Paula asks, did, sorry, did you make your own dark or is it from the tube? So yes, I made this black, or a very, very dark black was made by using, oops, let's go the other way, sorry. I used warm red, cool blue, and just a little bit of cool yellow, mix them together and I get a really nice dark color. Basically a, a super, super dark gray. Not quite fully black, because we'll see, I'll, I'm gonna do a little bit of outlining shortly, and you will see it, it is different. Or, well, you may not see it on camera, but, and you may not, you might barely see it in person, but there is a difference. But is it enough of a difference? Probably the difference is very, very small. And again, I really like the fact that I can make my own dark colors just by using the paint I have on the palette. And I've got a lot of paint on my palette from all these tubes that I otherwise would have thrown out. And I want to use some of it so that I don't end up just throwing it out as I would have done it had I not cut those tubes open. So I have also this vested interest <laughs> in maximizing the, that material. Okay, the other thing I wanna do is I've widened some of these lines. I still got my green here, so I just wanted to come back. And do a bit more.
So it's, yeah, okay. that hand is kind of expanding a little bit. I might do a little bit more white again there. This painting is going to change completely when we next put the warm red down here and then we start outlining with the black like everything is going to go very very different. So it's worth just sort of taking a, a moment to look at it this and just kind of appreciate it for what it is because you know I think sometimes people especially beginner artists have a hard time visualizing the next step. It's sort of like it's sort of like chess. If you've ever played chess with a really good chess player, they're thinking like two, three, five, ten moves ahead of where they are right now. Versus all you're, you're just like, uh, what do I do next? That's I can only see that one step ahead, right? So just like becoming a good chess player takes a lot of time and practice until you can start visualizing the longer game ahead. Same thing with painting. Sometimes it's just like all you can see is what you see in front of you and you can't visualize what it'll ultimately turn out. So you're kind of like, you're like, oh my goodness, what a mess. This is a disaster. Like, you're like, okay, it's, but this is where we are right now. We're not done yet, right? So we're going to continue working on it. Now I'm trying to decide, should I uh, go into... What I'm doing here, I'm just taking away some of the little bits of texture that I notice happening, like little tiny bits of paint that I can see on the camera is getting highlights and making it look little like little spots of white. 
And while it's not, I know it's going to dry, but still, even if it's on the wall and it's, that light is picking up, the or that texture is picking up light, it can be a little distracting, so. Just knocking those things back down. Okay, so how about we put in the red now? So we put in this pink as a ground. Now we're gonna put on the warm red over top of that. And it's going to, to in, in order to get a really nice even red here. And I'm gonna use a, a little bit of a larger brush to do this. Right, the, which is going to reduce the likelihood of tiny little brush strokes, which is not, there's again nothing inherently wrong with tiny little brush strokes, but if I want to get a nice even surface, a larger brush is going to help that. Maybe let's zoom in so you can just see how I'm using. Oops. Actually, maybe even besides that, let's let's go here. get kind of a generous amount of paint on the brush here. So I got a bit of white coming in, that white paint that I just painted earlier, not surprising. So I'll let it dry and then we'll come back and fix that area up. Nothing to panic about or worry about. It's just, just a little bit of wet paint and paint blending.
So, you know, as artists, we want it to look like it was all just so effortless. Just so easy. It just came right, like, just the, the paint just rolled off the tubes. Or right off the, <laughs> out of the tube, onto the painting. And then we just went to a cafe and, and chatted with our friends for the rest of the day. Painting is so easy. Artists love making it look easy, right? Even these like big flowing lines. It's another reason to use a big brush. Is we can kind of fake out that flowiness and make it look like it was done easy. Even if we labored over it for a long time. Turn the canvas around, or at least let's say to here. Oops, thought that was on camera. that line by that knee really thin. Hmm. Well, we can always, there's, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but will it fit in with the rest of the painting? It doesn't look like it right now. So I'm just going to I'm just going to leave that and we'll touch that up. Let's see, can I go into here yet? A little bit. Okay. I think there's a bit of white that's now on my brush, so that's okay. So let's just come back out. I mean, so how wide do I want to make that versus do I want to taper some of the other areas in like by the hand? I like the way that this has turned out. So I'm just going to let this red dry. I see a few places where it is a little like you can't see on camera, but it does look a little bit patchy. So I'll just wait for that to dry and then just do a little touch-ups as needed. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the way that layer turned out. Come 
<laughs> Lolly says, it's so sad. There's something so satisfying watching those big sweeping brush strokes with that bright red. It is very satisfying. It, that's doing those big, like that's one reason that having the, the, the bigger the brush, the more paint can fit on the brush. So that's why, oops, sign painters will use a brush like that, right? You could see this is a really long bristles as opposed to, I don't know if, how well that comes out on camera, but you know, sign painting, and I've done a little bit of sign painting, you, you can get a big long bristle, you can get some that are even longer than that. You get a lot of paint on them, and then you can really paint because the paint is slowly drawn just, I don't know, by physics. I don't know how it works, but it works just slowly, like a calligraphy pen comes out the tip. And it's really fun to paint with that, that kind of a tool. It takes a lot of practice. It is tough to do, but it is, when you get the technique down, it's very satisfying. And it's just, I don't know, very nice. Um... John's, hi John, John says the different widths of white give depth to the figure. I totally agree. I mean, that's definitely one of the things with mine is I started to kind of create a bit of, uh, of maybe too even of, of an outline. And that's <laughs> maybe a bit of just my OCD or something coming through there as opposed to just like you are absolutely 100% that the, the as the line kind of widens and thins, it does give a little bit more of a dynamic quality to the dancer. So it, rather than just being someone who's like, oh, is trapped in space and then we're outlining them, it gives more of a sense of the body moving, right? So great point, John. It is something that, um, you know, depending on your painting, you, you're certainly welcome to make it more even, or especially if you're having problems keeping it even, really embrace what Nikki de saint Fal did and allow it to get much thinner in some places than other places. Right? So, I'm just going to, to touch this up with a little bit of white. There's a bit of pink in this white. Which I don't, I'm, I'd never really mind if my colors get a little bit, quote unquote, off because I'm colors are mixing. Even in a painting like this where it's kind of the idea is being a little bit more even. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow dry this and then I'm gonna do the the outlining on the inside of the figure with a Posca pen. So I'm gonna use this here in a moment. This is the seven millimeter, very, it's the smallest is it pin type is the way they describe it. it makes the smallest thinnest line which is perfect because there's a lot of tiny little details in here in fact just before i blow dry i'm going to come in here with this white <laughs> as i start stamping my hand getting paint on my hands
Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna blow dry this. We'll mute the microphone for just a moment. Okay, so John had to go, so goodbye, John. And Lolly says, uh, definitely one thing I've taken from these classes uh, is the use of bigger brushes. It's certainly much more fun than fiddly tiny brush strokes all the time. Absolutely. That's another thing I often see with beginner painters when I'm painting with people in the classroom you know, I'll go and I'll grab a big brush and start doing things and I immediately see people going right to a small brush to do the same area because people think a small brush means more accuracy, which is sometimes true, of course, but sometimes small brushes also introduce tiny little marks, which unless they're perfect, can also look imperfect right because they draw our attention to them whereas a large brush stroke you can sort of it covers more area and you know it takes a bit of practice but if you can get the hang of it actually makes things look smoother I mean the difference would be like if you tried to paint your wall instead of with a big roller with you know it's small little brush yes it's also first of all it's gonna take you ten times longer but you're also gonna start seeing the texture of the brush strokes you're, you're, it's going to be some parts are going to be more more opaque and more transparent than others and it's just you're going to have a very uneven surface so uh, okay I was going to use the Posca pen here so as I said I'm going to use this Posca pen and let's just test it out make sure it's still working as advertised beautiful so this is acrylic paint inside of a pen i love using these things let's dive right in let's go right to the center here now i could start if if there were you know i may even decide depending you know i think i've done a pretty good job outlining this whole thing but let's say just for our sake i'm gonna go around here like that and just gives things just that tiny little bit of extra um, uh, sharpness And 
And whoops, look at that. Kind of a wonky circle. Which is obviously intended to be uh, a breast, right? So, um, it's okay if it's a little bit not perfectly circular because what part of the human body is perfect anyway? Um, they're perfect just the way they are. Uh, yeah, that's good enough to move on from that area. Oh, yes, I need to do... You can see, like, what a difference. All of a sudden, poof, painting just starts coming together instantly. Now this is obviously done with blue. I'm gonna use my black Posca marker to do this. And I'll paint that up here in a moment, but The one thing I don't like about these Posca pens is how they tend to be a bit glossy. Um, and so while on camera, I think that look everything looks great in person. If you see it from, if you, if you look at the painting from a bit of an angle, you'll see this really shiny line work, which I don't like at all. Um, so it's a bit of a trade-off. I haven't really investigated to see if they make matte versions of these pens. I would say the majority of people really like glossy paint. I'm just not one of them. Uh, it's just a personal preference kind of thing. how she got a little bit more of a bend in that leg than I didn't too, but we can't all be incredible artists like Niki de saint Fal, so I'm not going to punish myself for not being as great of an artist as she is, or she was.
think I'm going to come back and, and tidy some of the blue lines up here when I'm done all of this. I didn't mean to think of like these outline the 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 black lines as being the end of the painting, right? I still feel like there's little things I want to do. I'm gonna add white here. Maybe I'll just skip that and Let's see if you can see. Can you see that right there? How how different those lines look than the rest of the painting. That's so that's the one thing. It kind of like sometimes it looks really actually pretty cool and it adds like a whole other level to the painting. Sometimes. Sometimes, however. For me, it annoys me because when you catch it from that one angle, it's like, oh, what is the, what are those lines? Some people look at that and probably like, I could care less, Michael. I don't know why that bothers you. It's kind of cool. And so that's, that's just personal preference. bit of extra things sometimes stuff just builds up on the tip of that so which should we go up here now the company that makes these pens also makes lots of different colors I have a bunch of them but I think I'm just gonna stick with the black outlining for today
One thing I also noticed about using these Posca pens is that um, they tend to take a little bit longer to dry. So just be careful when you're using them that you don't smudge um, your hand all over the surface when you're expecting it to be completely cured. Do a bunch of little dots there. Okay, maybe I'll just leave that for right now. Let's zoom back out. Actually, let's just see how things look. This at this point. Uh, <laughs> what are all the comments here? Look at all these. Um, uh, Lolly, I can't remember if I meant, read this before. Lolly says, "In if I brush over the lines, I can always go back. My whole painting attitude has changed these last couple months after learning from you." Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and I didn't think I'd like this painting too much before the stream started, but now I've seen you paint it. Definitely have a better appreciation for it. I expect that is true of many pieces you work on. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel that way sometimes about the paintings I'm working on. There's, I mean, there's somewhere I'm like, oh, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. And then I start painting. I'm like, whoa, this one's a lot more like rigid than I expected it to be. And then there's some that I begin, and I'm thinking like, oh, I was expecting this to be a little bit of a, a slog. And then I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually way more fun. And you'd think I would be able to pick up on those things more. Um, but every painting just surprises me. There's little things that I don't expect that just um, unfold as the painting unfolds. And sometimes it's because of the, you know, it's like making a painting is like going on a road trip and, you know, you sometimes set out pretty confident, you know, exactly how to get there. And then you just sometimes, you know, things happen or you decide to take a detour here and there. And, and that's the fun of taking a road trip is those unexpected detours generally. <laughs> um... So, I'm going to blow dry all of that. Some good good comments in here. Um, Paula says, I purchased 48 medium tip markers of water-based ink from DeSears. Good inks, only $11. So that would work really well on paper, for sure. On canvas, I'm not quite so sure, but that sounds like a great buy. $11, bucks, that's, that's a good deal. Um, Lori says, when you glaze the painting will the difference in gloss disappear or I meant varnish the painting you know I'm not sh I would expect it would change a little bit I'm not sure how how much different and I've been meaning to actually do a test on that um, 
one one thing that a varnish does often do is is sort of unify I mean part of the the, the reason for doing it is not only to protect the the artwork from damage because if someone graffitis over it or a little kid throws spaghetti all over it you can wipe it off and if you and if some of that varnish comes off that's great that's what it's intended to be for right as opposed to when you wipe it off and the paint coming off and you're, ooh that's upsetting <laughs> right so the varnish protects it so it, and it also kind of unifies the whole surface and makes it all integrated into one um, so I would imagine I've never glazed or sorry a varnished after having put the Posca pen on there so my I would just be guessing as to its uh, effect although I would say that it would it, it would go away somewhat. Whether it goes away completely, I don't know. Now, I've, I also have very rarely ever uh, varnished an acrylic painting. Um, even my oil paintings, I've never really been into the varnishing. I know I've I've had these discussions with some of my other friends who are painters, and um, some of them that's some of their favorite parts for them that's like the painting is officially finished when it's been varnished because you really don't usually want to be painting over top of the varnish unless uh unless you're restoring a painting because that's often what they'll do is they'll when they restore a painting is they strip off all the varnish put a new varnish over top and then paint the restoration colors on top of that varnish so that the original surface is not touched it's sort of like they've they've stripped off that top layer put a layer of saran wrap you could say over top of it and then paint on the saran wrap so then if anything ever happens and you don't like that and 50 500 years later they can peel off that saran wrap and go right back to the beginning put a new varnish and repeat that step right um that didn't always happen. Uh, the conservation methods have, have changed radically over time, but uh, and have significantly improved, although there's still great debate over how the best ways to do it. I'm tr oh, there was a, recently a major controversy where um, I think it was in Italy, there was a conservator who was conserve like doing some restoration work on a painting and all of these conservators from around the world were like you know writing signing like a petition saying this is a bad idea you're going to be just making marks on it that are going to ir irrevocably change that painting you must stop all this it was you know conservators are generally very laid back quiet people so when they get <laughs> motivated like that it's like whoa what's going on if the conservators are are, are going to go protest something that didn't generally gets people's attention because they're they're people that uh, I mean I'm sure there's probably a couple wild conservators out there <laughs> who are like you're not all of us conservators are are like that some of us are like crazy wild party animals you artists think you've got a monopoly on wildness you've never been to a conservators party <laughs> you know maybe Maybe, you know, it's like librarians, we have this idea that they're all very quiet, but maybe they let loose on Friday nights and, and I 
I'm just not cool enough to be invited to the conservators' party. Or parties. So, you know, I, right now I could easily call it a day, right? I, you know, there's this is just me f doing a, my typical fiddliness at the end of a painting. And when I start my my intro to painting course over again in January, this is definitely not the kind of thing that I would be doing. I wouldn't be doing all this little stuff at the very end, but, uh, you know, I'd sort of get to this... I, w I would have stopped probably half an hour ago. Um, but there is... You know, this is kind of a different thing that I'm doing, and so I kind of want to to get it to a place where I can be really, really happy with them, and that I can hang on my on the mantle, and that just sometimes requires a little bit more. Oh, there's still so many people watching. That's cool. Uh, I was going to do a bit more of this Posca pen here. Little things that I... I notice. So once you've got those black lines in, I think it, you can really now see the full picture really coming into to pretty tight focus. And any little things that remain to be done should be pretty clear to you. I want to just take my dark blue and just maybe go back over some of these lines that were here originally that I think look a little bit transparent or It's funny, like, what is really cool, our daughter is just two years old, and I can, uh, well, I guess, two, what, uh, how many, not, I mean, birthday was in August, so time just seems to be flying. <laughs> At the end of the night, I, I bring these paintings up, and 
she always she she notices them and she looks at them and wants to hold them. This morning she went over to uh, the credenza where they're sitting. There's a, well, there's a few sitting on the credenza and she was taking them down <laughs> and chewing on the corners of, of the Picassos. Which I don't mind. I, I think it's funny, but, you know, there's it's probably not a good idea to eat the paint. So I was like, I... There's plenty of other things we can chew on other than paintings. I mean, that makes a big difference, it, especially, you know, when we're up close on camera, some of the stuff looks a little bit, doesn't quite have the oomph. But when it's, when, especially once all this dries, it tends to kind of, some of those streaky areas kind of disappear. But it's also, if you're standing even just a few feet away, you won't be able to see um, oops. sorry one second here just need to wait for Actually, let's go to transition to. Oh, is it working again? There we go. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, people won't ever be really looking at your paintings as close as you are, so. Some of those details that you see up close that drive you crazy. Or probably you're the only one who will ever really notice those. So it's not really worth obsessing over. You know, like don't sweat the small stuff. Because quite literally, it's very small stuff that no one else no will notice. And if anything, sometimes when you get up close and the painting kind of falls apart a little bit, I actually kind of think that's it's kind of nice to see. I kind of I like that when I when I'm looking at art that you know looks very different in a newspaper or magazine, and then you get up close and you see it in person. Ah. I'll let that boot up. It looks, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, I like seeing artwork by, you know, the great artists of the past, and you get up close and you're like, oh, wow, this is a, it looks like kind of a bit of a mess up close. Like, we're so used to seeing images by artists in books and magazines, and those, and sometimes these paintings are huge, and you see them in person, and you're like, wow. It actually looks kind of sloppy in person. Oops, I'm just touching up this area here. Actually, I think I'm going to use... Mm, might use a bigger brush. 
in a few places. So actually, let's just look at these side by side. I mean, we're basically done. So now it's just thinking to me, I'm trying to just decide what area, oh, maybe the little red dots would be nice. Do I want to thin any of these lines out? Or can I be kind of happy with the way they are? I think I'm going to round... So it's not a sharp point in there. Let me same thing here. perfectionist in you has your eye on the little pink heart. Is it this one right here? Oh, the outline there, that's what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I just gotta wait for that white to dry. So I think, while that's drying, let's zoom in. I'm gonna take uh, my red here. Maybe let's... do a bunch of tiny little dots. They're almost, kind of, now I'm looking at them kind of too small. Let's do this. 
this other side here. Oh, I just realized I'm not doing quite the way that she did it, but that's okay. There's a tiny bit, I think, of green dots in this one right up here. <clears throat> that so let's just oh no I'm wiping my see uh, so remember I said those Posca pens <sighs> okay so you just better just leave it than fiddle with it so now I'm gonna do some surgery here So that happens. You know, I could have just been walked away from this painting several times, but let's uh, mistakes happen, and it's worth just sort of maybe learning how we can fix them. See this, this is what I mean with these Posca pens is they can they take a while to dry and it's kind of frustrating. They kind of activate too with a little bit of water. As I say, most accidents happen within sight of home or within close to home or whatever. So when you're right, when you're done, that's just, I'm going to.
Okay, so let's just restore this painting. Okay, so let's take some cool yellow. the original looks like here. This green is pretty sticky. It's been sitting on the palette for a while, so it doesn't behave exactly the way that I'd like it to. Um, that's okay. Now I'm gonna blow dry that one more time, and then I'm gonna So another way, if I, this was a major problem, what I probably would do is even literally sand that back because there's a bit of texture there, but it's not a big problem. So let's just... it for a second while I come down here. Thank you for reminding me to finish that part of the painting. So just make sure you wipe that off before you put the cap back on so that whatever paint that was on the got on there, not the paint from the inside, but paint from the outside that got on there. Um, doesn't dry on the nib of the pen. Okay. I think that's good. Again, I could have been done a while ago, but I've just been, as I tend to sometimes do, fiddle. Maybe, though there was a few little things I wanted to just do with, I still have all this extra paint, so. With my, the dark color that I have, I'm just going to 
a few places that I, I thought could just use. If it's gonna go down the drain, or I tend actually I tended to, to wipe. I use the rags that I have, and I just because they're gonna go in the garbage after a few painting sessions. So I just I, I wipe as much paint off my onto those rags. I have a bunch sitting on my garbage can. So that after my painting session, I wipe as much paint off onto those rags, and eventually they get so covered in paint that they're just a, that are a crusty shell, and then they go into the garbage. That because technically you don't really want to be putting too much paint down the sink. It's not going to clog your sink, but all those little microplastics go out into the ocean, and guess who eats that? Right. So. If the fish in our on this planet have enough garbage that they gotta sort through than paint, right? Okay, yeah, there's still more that I could do, but um, let's see. <laughs> don't sweat the remember don't sweat the small stuff. Take your own advice, right? Yes, Michael. It's the twenty six, I believe. of this red before it goes down the drain. Touch that up. And just give any little patchy areas that are being erased. I don't think they show up on camera, but there we go. Okay, so let's just, uh, I think one last look at them side by side. Pretty close. I agree with what John said. There is something nice about in her version where that white outline is, is varies a little bit more than in mine. Like it makes it a little bit more dynamic. Um, but I'm not going to go and fiddle with it anymore. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for joining me, for painting with me, for listening to me blab on and on endlessly. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the support that I see in the chat, not just for myself, but again, Donna there. I don't know if she's left the, the, the episode for today, but again, best wishes to you, and I hope you get better as soon as possible and you're back on your feet painting. Uh, we can't wait to see the new paintings you make. Maybe you make something that talks a little bit about your, your experience as you've been healing. Um, just as we've been looking at Nikki de saint Fal and how she used her art to help her heal. Um, I, you know, I think that one of the things that, one of the purposes of art is uh, to help us overcome 
challenges, more specifically to trauma. I think everyone on Earth is, is, is dealing with some kind of trauma. Some people have had more intense traumas than others. Uh, but I think everyone, whether they want to admit it or not, or, or or even conscious of it, there are traumas that we're dealing with, and art sort of is um, shows us a way forward uh, when we're looking at art, but also when we make art ourselves, it helps us overcome traumas, right? It literally does things to the brain that help um, uh, heal the brain by 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 using the. If we're right-handed, we're using the left side of our brain all the time. The right side of our brain is often neglected. I was just reading an article the other day that talks about how we're living in a left brain dominated world more and more and the right side of our brains are atrophying or being atrophied. Um, so art is such a great healing power in the world, which I think is one of the the reasons why I love teaching these classes, I love seeing people get into art, and I want to encourage that as much as possible. Like, subscribe to the channel, you want to leave a donation, there's a PayPal link below, contact me through my website or through the Facebook group. Upload your version of today's painting to the Facebook group, because next Saturday at 1 o'clock Pacific time, we're going to gather together, we're going to put the brushes down, cheers with our champagne glasses, and congratulate one another on our achievements. We're going to be going all the way back to Van Gogh and talking about all the great paintings we made back in July or August. It was a while ago uh, because I haven't done a feedback episode in a little while. So we've got some catching up to do. And so please join me for that. Join me on Thursday this week where we're going to be painting Mickey Mouse. Right? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. Enjoy the rest of your week uh, and uh, stay safe wherever you are. We'll see you guys again very soon. Good night, everybody.